Good morning, and welcome to the Christian Indie Writers Podcast, where we encourage, inform, and support Christian indie authors on the road toward publication. I am Jennifer Carl Tong, and I write historical Christian romance. I'm Jamie Hirschberger. I write short fiction under the pen name J.R. Nichols. I'm Christina Katain. I write in multiple genres, including Christian dystopian fiction. I'm Rhonda Hagerman, and I write fiction and nonfiction. And we really appreciate you all for joining us this morning as we are live here um, from our individual studios, aka our houses. We're <laughs> <laughs> professional here on this podcast. That sounded really great, though. Uh, thank yeah. you. Yeah. I shouldn't have like I shouldn't have given it away. Like our little broadcast boost that we have in our you know at our disposal. Um, but we appreciate you joining us. We appreciate all of you that um, that like the things that we do on Twitter and that, that listen to the podcast and watch us on YouTube. If you want to never miss another one of our podcasts, make sure that down below you like us and you hit that little bell. Subscribe and hit the bell so that every time we go live, you guys will get a notice that we're on live. This is the time of our podcast where we sit down and have kind of like our water cooler moment, join with each other and ask how our week's been going, check in, see um, just how our, our personal lives are. So today I am going to start with Rhonda because she's the one that's smiling. <laughs> <You're okay. laughs> they actually look, 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 look like they're mad at me, so I'll just go with the person that was smiling. Okay. Well, I have to smile inside because I'm frowning when I go outside because we have an inch of snow after several days of 60 degrees here in Michigan. <laughs> I, um, so I got, oh, I'm so into gardening mode right now and seeing that snow out there literally makes me want to cry. But I knew better because I've come back from Colorado the first week of April to several inches of snow. So one inch I'm good with. All right. But, uh, yeah. You know, though, if you start with your cold crops cold weather crops like cabbage and kale they can handle the snow so you could be gardening right now i just haven't gotten okay. out of my garden yet so those are the gross ones thank you for that <laughs> um, and really i love that <laughs> no i do too i'm just kidding but um here i'm really not putting much of a vegetable garden in i'm doing my tomatoes uh, and my peppers and um they need the heat so. yes they do all right jamie what about you dear how are you doing today well, um, it's not snowing here. <laughs> Sunny Florida. Shocking. Um, actually, I I was really kind of like, what am I going to say at what's up? Like, things are just sort of same old, same old here. Um, but nothing really to complain about. God is good. And so is life. So smooth sailing. Hmm. What's up with you, uh, Jen? Well. Um, again, snowing here. So that does kind of affect things for us, but I am, um, I don't want to get into accountability corner stuff, but I am like dragging behind on my camp nano project. I just can't get into it. Um, even though I really want to write this, I can't get my mind away from these contemporary novels that I have been kind of like swirling around in my head and it's been really bad so yesterday i actually spent my writing time like writing in the contemporary world so i don't know how that's going to affect my nano moving forward um so we'll talk about that later in the accountability corner but personally my daughters my two youngest daughters are in a musical at our church and it's chaos right now because the musical is this weekend and my daughters are ready but no one else seems to be right and i shouldn't say no one else but so it was a very 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 long dress rehearsal last night we had tears this morning because my kids didn't want to go to school so that's what i've been dealing with is just uh the emotions of being nervous about the musical and just helping my kids to navigate those emotions but exciting yeah, times the end of really the school year is uh can be kind of nightmarish, can it? With everything yeah, we, coming to a culmination and all that. Yeah, we only have 11 weeks left, like less than two months, like, oh. or about two months, a little bit more than two months, I guess it does. Time and school will be out for the year. And that's just like crazy. So, all right, Tina, how about you, hon? How's your day going? Um, everything around here is just kind of moving along. There's nothing to write home about. Um, you got good news from your doctor. Your health yeah. is improving. Yeah. Yeah, I did. That's I great. I really want to talk about that, but 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> I just know that we had talked about how here. your health concerns. Just saying that you got good news, I think. Yes, I, I did lose nine pounds, but I hope I didn't just jinx myself by saying that because then I'm going to wake oh. up tomorrow and I have gained 15. Like that. Oh. <laughs> that doesn't work like that. Oh, come on. But then there's there's numbers that you said have shown improvement and like good things in general, right? So, yeah. Because right. I'm, I'm sure. my All my blood numbers are going down. Awesome. And down is good, right? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Yes. So, so sorry. Know, like to... Blood sugar, blood pressure, blood cholesterol. Oh, wonderful. If you want to take a swing at telling people something that's going on with me that I didn't want to talk about. We... <laughs> How's that rash <laughs> going, Jamie? Anything... How's my what? <laughs> How's your rash? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not that I like to keep it private. It's just like I ha I just hesitate to tell anybody mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. so many times I fall off the wagon and end up back where I started. Mm -hmm. So well, now you're accountable. Like, so uh, we're not going to let you. But you know what? It's not just about the. I think you're thinking about the weight, and it's not really just about the weight. It's about yeah. all these other numbers and the fact that your doctor literally said, "I'm proud of you" because of mm -hmm. it's hard work. Like I know because I've mm -hmm. and both like a bunch of us have been on a, a journey with our health mm -hmm. recently, and it is hard work. And sometimes you don't get big victories; and it's the little victories that add up. And so mm -hmm. it's more about just keeping yourself healthy. And we're just really happy to see that that that's starting to finally because you've been working so hard for so long you finally found the, the right advice of what you're supposed to be doing and i've been right. there so. yeah. yeah and we've been praying for your health so anyway just well, kind of you. a little bit of a praise report so mm -hmm. all right well i mentioned a little bit ago about um nanowrimo camp nanowrimo and right here in the podcast all four of us have begun begun new projects whether they're editing projects or writing projects we're all kind of um <clears throat> on the on, the cusp of something new. And we know that beginning a new project can sometimes be um, a little difficult, even if you are a seasoned writer, um, but especially if you're a new writer. So we thought we'd start uh, the be at the beginning and cover some of the basics with you this week, such as what makes for a good opening paragraph, scene, or even page. Um, so we've all been there. You've got your document open, staring at the blank screen, the cursor, <laughs> the cursor is like taunting you as it flashes at you. I mean, it's uh, even called a cursor. Like yeah. it's oh, right. <laughs> flashing That's at its you. job. How do you ladies handle that? Like, how do you stop it from becoming overwhelming? How do you like overcome that whole, that like kind of frozen moment of where do I start? I personally don't start with the first line. Oh, oh that's good. Mm -hmm. What do you start with? Well, for instance, even in this nonfiction that I'm compiling right now, and I'm, I'll blow my um, accountability corner at the end, but I'm not, I don't have my cover to show you guys today. But um, anyway, I still have not written the first line. I am almost completely done with the formatting and everything. And I'm saving the first paragraph really for the very last thing that I do. Because mm, wow. I want to encompass everything in the book. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, in a, it's a nonfiction, so it doesn't need to be the same as a fiction beginning, but, you know, I want it to kind of let the reader know what to expect. Have any of the rest of you ever done that? Not start at the beginning? I do that all the time. Yeah. Because I'll, I'll be inspired with a scene. Mm -hmm. Oh, and even... Even this novel that I'm currently editing that I've been working on forever, what I originally wrote as the opening scene is no longer the opening scene because as the story progressed and changed and kind of became its own thing, the beginning of the story changed. Mm. So Yeah, be because you might you have to lead them somewhere else, right? If um if you change the middle, then you can't start in the same right. spot, right? And yeah. even if you don't change the middle, sometimes you realize that you need to start your reader off in a different spot than what you originally, I mean, because if you're telling the story to yourself when you start, then once you get it done, you're start thinking, okay, how am I going, what am I going to do with this opening that's going to really impact the reader, you know, other than mm -hmm. once upon a time. Right. Which Jen, the once upon a time is often silent nowadays, but it's there in a right. lot of books. 
Jen, um, I, I want to kind of toss this question over to you by just kind of pointing out how when we went into NaNoWriMo this past November and it was about to be like day one and Jen Jennifer was like, so, you know, it's time to start writing your story. And of course, you've been thinking about it for all this time. So the beginning is going to be so easy because you've been thinking and outlining and planning. And I'm like sitting here thinking, oh, my goodness, I haven't even thought about how am I actually going to begin <laughs> to tell this and I just remember this feeling that I had of like dread that was settling in oh. but you were ready to go and why is that what did yeah. you yeah all right so in my defense I said that because we in the podcast here and through Facebook live and we did a lot of prep with our audience and so we spent all of October prepping for for NaNoWriMo so when I said that term when I said that but you know oh you spent all this time I met everybody who had been on that journey with us so like it wasn't like I just assumed um so yeah I was ready for that project because of again it's not a surprise I probably say it a hundred times uh, a year an episode it seems like i'm a plotter mm -hmm. and i do a lot of work before i start a novel planning out um so <laughs> i already know what the first chapter is going to be but generally for me i think i'm different than um than what like what tina was saying is that most of my story ideas come from the first chapter like when i get like inspired with a story idea it's usually that hook it's the hook that usually comes to me before the rest of the story comes it's not the overall story so for me I, um i guess it's um a little different i do tend to write my first um chapter first mm. because i have to get that that out sometimes i write it before i even outline because then it gets kind of exciting for me and then that's when i start doing my my what if statements and i start kind of grab you know, blocking out like what's going to happen for my different disasters and like that. So, so, but I'm sure even as you're sitting down to actually put that story idea onto paper, you know, I mean, do you start with John Smith was standing at the window? Like, I mean, the actual putting the first words. Mm -hmm. So, um, how do you overcome like that? Is it just a matter of, uh, really not editing and just doing it or what? Yeah, writing sprints for sure. We've said that before too. Like, would you guys agree that sometimes just sitting down and doing a writing sprint can give you your first chapter that yeah. you didn't yeah, even know was there? Yeah, because then you have no choice. You have to write for 20 minutes. So you've got to put down something. Right, and even if you hate it, at least you can edit it. At least you have something. And um, like Tina, I have um, gone back before and, and changed my first chapter as well. Um, I had to change the, the nano project a little bit. I still had this idea that it was going to be this girl throwing herself at her professor back in like 1920s. Um, but I had to change it a little bit because of who was going to be present at the time and how it was going to happen and what was going to happen next because of different things that happened in the story later. So, I mean, I still had to go back and change it, but I, I did write that scene first. So, mm -hmm. all right. So um, let's. When I was researching this, I found something that I'm going to use the next time uh, that I begin, that I start. The next one I start, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, I'm going to use these as a writing sprint. This is from the blog Creative Nonfiction, and they have several different ways that you can start your book. So it could be the setting or a character, or it could be a warning, or it could be the hint of a mystery, or symbolism, action, suspense, voiceover, uh, parent, or the whole family, blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to go through all of these and just sprint ways that I could start a novel in all these different ways um, to, I don't know, kind of expand my brain a little bit, um, maybe help with the outlining process, because I'm actually going to do this before I outline to see mm -hmm. what I really want the book to be about. All right. That's some really good advice. You said that was the creative nonfiction uh, website? Called just creative nonfiction.org. Dot org. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay. So speaking of that, um, you know, we can talk a lot about, you know, things that we might want to do, whatever, but at some point you've just got to do it. Right. So there are different ways to start your story. We've talked about this a little bit off camera as well. And one of them was just if, um, we want, we wanted to talk about, is it required to drop your reader right into the action? Jamie, I know that you were, um, given that advice from somebody recently. Do you want to share 
that story. Yeah. <clears throat> I submitted a piece to um, an anthology and the feedback that I got back was nobody is going to give your story a chance because you, you're not starting off with action. And, um, you know, upon further investigation, it's just a matter of knowing your market. I shouldn't have submitted the piece that I did because when I went to read everything that these people were publishing, it was like, you know, dropping literally into a battle against aliens. And here you are with your machine gun blasting and blah, 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 blah. So apparently this is their readership, right? But mm -hmm. this person was very dogmatic and said, short story readers have a very short attention span and they will put your story down. Um, meanwhile, I had let Rhonda and Tina read what I had submitted and they said that they were absolutely hooked and had to know what was going to happen. And so... Mm -hmm. It's just interesting that someone could be so dogmatic that a story has to start with this action. So I wonder if, you know, Tina and Rhonda maybe just wanted to read it because it was my piece or, or what? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, am I off base by thinking there's more than one good way to start a short? Well, I don't know if, you know, if short stories have different, rules but i doubt it because a story is a story no matter how long it is and some of the stuff that i've been doing a lot of reading on craft lately and so i've been reading books like the story genius and hooked and they say um both of them say to start it they that they use the term in media res which means in the middle of things which doesn't mean necessarily action as far as the plot is going but in the middle of a problem and a lot of times the there you there's a separation between the plot and the story. So like story um, in my novel is about this girl who feels uh, unredeemable and her journey to find redemption. That's the story. The plot is completely separate from the story, but the plot drives the story. And so then, so their advice is start in the middle of things. So you know that this problem's been going on for a while and you have to drop your character right into her problem. That doesn't necessarily mean a battle or, you know, some external action going on. It it's, has to do with what is the story you're trying to tell and what are you trying to get your reader to, to connect with? And that's I think, why I think we liked that piece is because it was internal. You, mm -hmm. We were inside your character and we were, you were showing us the internal struggle that was going on with that character. And mm -hmm. that's what drew us. Right. And I still to this day wonder what that little girl is doing. <laughs> I'm hoping <laughs> that you have finished that story or at least you're still working on it because it was a fantastic story. And I'll tell you, I don't know, you know, in the 80s, there are so many movies that the whole point of the movie was action scenes. And I have no interest in a book that is just one long action scene. I want exactly what Tina was just talking about. So and that I think should be a lesson in critique is that you should not say absolutely you are wrong or this is bad writing or whatever just because that one person didn't care for it so i think there's a responsibility when people are critiquing to pay attention to what they're saying to people i would agree i think that the um the the spectrum here i can totally recognize because as tina's talking i'm thinking about how many new writers do I read when they they submit something and are asking for feedback? And it was like, John was born on the coast of Maine. I'm, I'm, I'm really just pulling this out of my head. So if this sounds like something you wrote or read, it's just totally a coincidence. But it starts with like, he had four sisters. He was the third born. Like, do you know what I mean? And they uh -huh. kind of start with like a lineage or they go like way back and tell a person's, you know, history. So, I mean, I guess that would be an example of not really putting someone into the story, um, right? Yeah, right. there's actually, if you re read those two books, both of those books address that and say, no, that's not, we don't care about when they were born and we want to know the problem now and right in the middle of it. Well, okay, so then everybody. How do you, I how do, do you, like genealogy, whether it's fiction or not, but anyway. Sure. How do you contrast that though with like, okay, so... I've also gotten the feedback in the past. I don't want to hear about stuff happening to your characters until I care about your character. How do you care so, about them then? 
That's what I'm, well, that's what I'm saying. No, what I'm saying is the feedback is you can't, you can't put someone in the middle of say a battlefield and expect your reader to care whether or not they live or die in the battle. If you haven't given them any mm -hmm. reason to care about your person. I, I think it can be done. You can put a person in the middle of a battlefield in the middle of a battle and get into his head and show us what he's feeling and thinking and the, and the internal struggle. Like maybe he doesn't like killing people and he, and so his, he's having a, you know, a internal battle, whether, you know, or not he's doing the right thing, or maybe, you know, there's something else, whatever his internal struggle is, you can show us that in the midst of that battle and still draw us into the character. Right. So speaking specifically on battle scenes, when I was researching for my book too, um, what I had found too, and I, this is what I had kind of said to someone else who was writing a scene and it was just like, couldn't get through it because it was all about the sword doing this and then this and all these details. And it's like, I told the person I was giving the critique to, um, go in. We don't care about all those details because like, I know you've done this, all this research and like, you're, you you do not know what's off with the scene. What's off with the scene is that we don't know what's going inside their head. When the person is actually fighting, they're not thinking now my sword's going to do this. And then I'm going to do this. They're in their head going, I hope I don't die. Oh my gosh, that really hurt. Like this is where you need to be. And so for example, with my book two, um, we, John is kind of like in, um, kind of like, uh, the zone and we see him worrying about where will is he's worried about one of his um one of the other guys that's in the war with him and then we see him um see in the face of someone he's just killed and that kind of stuff so that so all of a sudden you know who john is you know a little part of him because we're inside his head so you don't have to tell us everything about this character for us to care about them you need to give us a little bit of just a glimpse of who they are or who they want to be for us to buy into the fact that we want to know more about them. Jen, um, you had mentioned, well, what comes to me usually is the hook. And I think that this is one of those moments where we're speaking writer ease and someone who's like um, brand new to all of this would be like, what are you talking about? So do you want to touch on that? Yeah, sorry. Um, I hate when I do that. So the hook is, it comes within the first, it could be the first page, within the first chapter, but it comes pretty quickly. And it is the thing that literally hooks your reader in, that makes your reader not want to put the book down. It is the thing that's either shocking or sad or endearing, something that, that evokes an emotion in your writer. So they buy into the story and they want to continue with your characters. With my first novel, Searching for Anna, um, the um, you know, our main character has a tea party with a little girl, which is sweet. But really the hook is that this guy that we've already started to really like is getting sent away. He's getting sent away to boarding school and we don't know what's going to happen next. So that's kind of the hook. Uh, book two, yes, there's a battlefield. And at the end of the first scene, you don't know if they survive. So that's the hook. And then as well as the second half of the first scene is... Um, the woman finds out another woman finds out that the man she's supposed to marry has been cheating on her. Um, and her, she's heartbroken. So, um, you, I give you, I'm hoping that I give you enough of the internal of these characters that you want to know more about them. Then all of a sudden you experience something like shocking from them or you're like, Oh no. And then you want to read more. I guess so, uh, a mystery would be different, right? Right. So a hook and a mystery would be mm -hmm. different than what it would be in romance. Well, a lot of times it's the body. Yes. You know, because the body's supposed to appear really quickly. Mm -hmm. Some kind of romance is that's. I was going to say. <laughs> I don't write that. On the Christian I don't write that. <laughs> like that kind of romance. <laughs> that's very funny. Aww. Uh, All right, so I do think it's genre specific, though, because I've gotten a lot of really great feedback on searching for Anna that people really, really enjoyed the opening scene, uh, the historical reference of it, and that we really, like, they really kind of became endeared to Warren. Um, so we'll see when um, book two and um, Avoiding Esther comes out because it's completely different. I already, my editor, two editors that have read it were like, Wow, that first scene was not what I expected. So it's not gory or anything. It's just a little bit, I think, maybe outside of genre. I didn't really think of it that way, but maybe it is. So we'll see how that goes. I, I don't think so, because I've read your part, at least part of your opening scene. Mm -hmm. And I 
to re um, read or read. I like to watch a lot of these movies that usually they're British and they usually have to do with World War II. And they're, the, a lot of them start out with guys in the war mm -hmm. and the scenes just like, I mean, I feel like I've seen that scene mm -hmm. over and over again, but it never gets old. Kind It's one of those kind of scenes. It, one of the, the things with talking about starting your story, one of the rules of romance is you have to introduce your main characters as quickly as possible, which is the whole reason why I wrote the prologue for Searching for Anna, which I guess I didn't start off with the, with the first scene. Now that I think about that, that one had to be written later. Um, so one of the things I struggled with with Esther's story was because John is in France fighting the war and Esther is in Lansing, Michigan, uh, you know, n never had met. Like, how do I melt these two characters together as quickly as possible? And I did it actually in two separate scenes. But the way that I um, made them kind of meet is that the way that I made those two characters come together was in similarities in the scene. Even though it's completely different things are happening, they both feel like they're like they've been pierced, you know, with a knife. And so I, I, I tried doing it that way. So again, we'll see when it releases if um if that worked. <laughs> All right, so I do think it's genre specific. Obviously, we talked about um, romance versus mystery. Um, so, Tina, you already talked about that. Sorry, here I am going through. We kind of got off track a little. Not off track, we just went out of order. So, okay, so if we're not going to drop in the middle of the action, if we're not going to all of a sudden be in the middle of a, of a war or in the middle of a fist fight or a murder like happening right then, what are some other ways that we can start a story? Well, you can start with just uh, talking or describing or, well, not describing, but you just have a character that's very endearing to the reader and, again, work on building up that emotional investment. Um, so I kind of call it like a slow burn. So you're like, oh, this is intriguing, and you still have to pepper it with enough. Um, like, again, you don't want a chronology of their birth. You don't want – but so, for example – um, someone's worried about a test that they have to take. And, and it's totally relatable because you've been that girl who is going in for testing day. You didn't sleep well last night or whatever. So mm -hmm. you get your readers involved with a character. And in and, and stories that you have to do world building, a lot of times you need to start with setting. Because, mm -hmm. um, but you just don't want to go, oh, there were mountains and a river and some trees and a village. You want to put your character in the setting with their internal stuff that's going on at the same time that you're interspersing the trees and the river and the mountains because you, nobody wants to sit there. Well, maybe like nature lovers. I don't know. Maybe somebody wants to read about mountains and rivers, but it's the character. Mm -hmm. I mean that the character and their, then their life and their mm -hmm. struggles is what is going to draw the reader. Mm -hmm. And, that's what you have to start with, whether you're describing a setting or whether you're in a battle or whether they're just staring out the window forlorn because their mom just died. Um, Would you guys say that the opening for my Phoebe novel uh, is a slow burn? She's on the train. We see her looking out the window, describing the tree, and we get a little bit of like what she's been going through and what she's going home to. Yeah, I would, I would think that that's exactly an example yeah. because I remember, I don't think I realized that that was the very first scene of your novel, but knowing that and thinking about it and remembering the feeling that I had, yeah, I mean, you know, because she, she's looking at this woman with a child and thinking about like her different life choices and things like that. And we're invested in her and we want to know what happens when she gets off the train. Right. And how many movies have we seen where it, the opening scene is somebody sitting on a bus or a train or driving in their car? on their on their way to somewhere new mm -hmm. um and going over in their mind this transition in their life i mean it's really kind of a trope but it is a trope because it works well mm -hmm. we play an improv game when i teach improv classes and we call it um once upon a time and basically the the kids are supposed to take turns telling the parts whatever but the bottom line is the components are once upon a time when suddenly because of that and finally, and it's just a basic story structure. So when you're writing a story that way, you're kind of saying, you know, they have to end their first comment with just like every other day. So five geese were swimming around in the pond, just like every other day, 
when suddenly a fox appeared or whatever. So you're setting people up to understand how life is normally for your characters. And then you're flinging at them something that changes everything. Now, the trick is to make that still interesting. Because again, like Tina said, you know, unless you're Tolkien or something, you know, vast and copious amounts of description of what the dirt was actually comprised of or whatever isn't going to thrill anybody. You've got to still pepper it with interesting things that your characters are doing, in my opinion. Do you think that the length of the slow burn has an effect as well? Because I'm thinking again, back to my chapter, which is different than the other two books I've written, um, that it's a fairly short chapter. And then all of a sudden she trips on her way out of the train and lands in the arms of a handsome Michigan state trooper. So do you, do you think that that has an effect too? Like that it could maybe start off, you could do a slow burn, but could it, could you make the slow burn too long? Do you think, or if it's well yeah. written, it doesn't matter. Do you think so? Yeah. Cause if it burns too slow, it could just burn out. <laughs> but I think I think your first chapter though is great. I am absolutely the reader that you targeted for that, and I love it. That is my favorite piece that I've read from the whole uh, book so far. Oh, so. Well, thank you. Awesome. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. Oops. Um, okay, so we talked about mystery a little bit already. Is there any other genre specific um, openings you guys want to talk about, or do you want to say more about mystery? Uh, well, I'll just say that um, I'm probably going to repeat the same thing that Tina said, basically. But um, we didn't start immediately with the body. In fact, it comes in um, probably right at the edge of where it should. But we started that novel with um, her character arc. And I don't really want to say a whole lot more than that. But it, um, we felt it was important to start with that right from the beginning. And it's not action. I mean, it's very slow action. Um, maybe you could call it slow burn, mm, but so that's all I have to say about mystery. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you're stuck with, um, some kind of a, a, well, of course, I think the best advice is to just write and worry about your actual beginning later. But another interesting way to start off a piece, if you're just not sure what will hook the reader is you could have somebody say something. What? What did they just say? What does that mean? I mean, it could be something very specific, like I shouldn't have done that or whatever. And then you read on just to find out that a person, I don't know, spilled her tea or something very insignificant. But if you start off with somebody saying something, that leads you to ask questions. That's also a good way to get the reader to kind of read that next sentence and the next one. I think it would be interesting and fun um, when we're reading our our uh, pieces, our feeding of the back pieces today, to see what the opening of each of our stories are. Oh yeah, I mean, what happened there? Like, hmm. I don't know. I just think that would be fun. Yeah, because we were under the gun to just get it done, right? Right, right. No time to think. Just start your story. Fine. I think I think that's a really great transition into doing doing our um, feed you back time because we've kind of already all covered about how we deal with it. Unless there, did anyone have anything more that they wanted to say about how you start your stories? Well, the only thing I wanted to add is if you're really stuck and you really want to write something, go find a writing prompt and set a timer because this the pressure of having to start will make you start, and you can always go back and change it later. That was going to be my transition into the feeding of the back time. Thank you very much, Tina, for taking care yeah, of that. Yeah, of great minds. And every episode of the Christian Indie Writers Podcast, before we start, we sit down for 15 minutes and we do a writing prompt, a timed writing prompt, um, based on sometimes words, sometimes a, a starter sentence, sometimes just a general idea. And we only get 15 minutes to write. I repeat, only 15 minutes to write. So we share with you live on the podcast our raw, unedited pieces. Um, and when we give our feedback for this, we only give um, positive, encouraging feedback because it's not been edited yet. We're not looking for that kind. We're just looking for... Uh, what you found that you liked about the piece. And um, so today, and oh, I also wanted to say too, that my piece that I'm working on for Camp Nano is book one of my Widows of the West series. But book two is actually came from a writing prompt that we did for the podcast last summer. So you can truly get a whole book out of one of these little activities. So um, if you're not watching us live, and you would like to try this, go ahead and pause the video after you hear the words and then sit down for 15 minutes and write it. And we would love for you to share that with us. I would love and to it, read that. Yeah. yeah. So fun. Send, it, 
Yeah, send it to us through Twitter. You can uh, DM me if you follow up. DM the Christian Indie Writers Podcast if you follow us. Um, if not, you could also put it in the comments here if you don't care if anybody else sees it. But we would love to see that. We would really appreciate that. So our words for today were, all right, you know what? Since I'm hosting, I'm going to call on someone else because I always have to read these. So Jamie, mm -hmm. what were our words for today? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, can you guys hear me? Okay. Cause I'm yeah. like glitching in and out here. Okay. So, uh, the words today were chocolate, which made everybody say, mm, mm -hmm. when we read that word foundation, aloof forest and cousin. So again, if you're playing along at home, those words are chocolate foundation, aloof, forest and cousin. I will report. I am happy today that I got all five words. Yay me. Yay. <laughs> it doesn't happen very often. <laughs> all right. All right, Jamie, why don't you go ahead and get us started? When my cousin gifted me a kitten from her champion Persians litter, I'm sure she expected it to be a blessing to our family. Instead, it was a curse. Not only is Puffy aloof, deigning to be bothered to spend time Oh, should be not deigning to be bothered to spend time in the same room with as any of our family members or visitors. She is also a downright jerk. She runs around the house meowing all night long, making getting a restful night's sleep nearly impossible. She won't stay off the counters. And given the opportunity, she will knock your glass of chocolate milk off the table and right onto your cream colored seat cushions. Then she'll sit in the center of the room, licking a paw and pretending to be ignoring you as you clean up the mess. Occasionally, she'll look up from her grooming and make eye contact, and you'll swear that she's gloating. <laughs> On one occasion, I was preparing for my nephew's wedding. In spite of Michael's being laid off, I'd purchased a new dress, a navy blue number with a slit up the side and a silver embellishment at the gathered waist. I just knew I was going to slay in it. Puffy, suddenly social, hopped up onto the sink while I was putting on mascara and too focused to really notice her presence. In a flash, she'd whipped out her paw and sent my almost full bottle of foundation onto the floor. It shattered, turning my nearby gown into an abstract piece of medium beige art. When I showed up at the wedding in the same forest green dress I'd worn to my niece's wedding only the previous summer, my wonderful cousin, who'd been seated in first to flick her eyes up and down my form and comment that I must be particularly fond of that dress. No, I told her. In fact, I like this dress almost as much as I like you for saddling me with that cursed animal. What? Why? What happened? I explained to her my general dislike for the animal and related the events of the evening to her. Well, she replied, what on earth was your dress doing in the bathroom? In that moment, I could see why my cousin had such an affinity for these animals. She was just as aloof and annoying as they were. I made a mental note to keep my cocktails away from the edge of the table. <laughs> Very good. That was really good. I don't like your cousin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking it you're not a cat person. Uh, I'm really not a cat person. <laughs> I was just thinking that because everything that you were describing as annoying, I was like, oh. Yeah. Well, and here's the thing. I, I I do know some cats that I like. Do you know what I'm saying? But you know what I mean? So just I also have encountered some not great cats. So, I mean, just blanket statement, I would not prefer to own a cat. <laughs> Fortunately, I, I mean, this is not fortunate. <laughs> My child is allergic to cats. It's not a fortunate thing, but it's fortunate in that any temptation to come home with a cute little kitten is promptly thwarted because kittens I love. Cats, uh, not so much. Oh, <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like puppies and children. They they grow up. <laughs> oh. <laughs> anyway. We just lost half of our viewers right there. Yeah. We've alienated everybody now. <laughs> a pet is a lifelong. Oh, no. We lost. Oh, oh there okay. she's back. Okay. All right. Well, while Jamie's figuring out her glitchiness there, Tina, why don't you go ahead and redeem yourself after that comment and show us a show us your awesome writing from today. Okay. 
Chocolate is a horrible substance, thought Carrie. The only thing worse than trying to wipe up a, co a chocolate-covered toddler with dried-out baby wipes would be trying to wipe off a poop-covered toddler. A loud sound like a muffled boat horn emanated from little Joey's diaper. Please, no, she thought, moving around the junk that filled her back seat in search of a water bottle that wasn't completely empty. All she found was a half bottle of flat Sprite. She stared at it a moment, shrugged, then opened it, pouring it over the baby wipes to most moist. <laughs> Good thing we aren't going to that enchanted forest experience today. You are about to be a bug magnet. A few minutes later, she sat back to inspect her handiwork. From a distance, everything looked normal. As long as, he, as long as nobody touched him and felt how sticky he was, everything would be fine, she told herself that just before Joey began licking the back of his forearm. Yummy, he said. <laughs> Carrie groaned, then grabbed him and headed into the school building. This was the prestigious School for Young Sol Scholars, East Hampton, Ca East Hampton Campus. And getting your preschool in was the dream of every young parent in the Tri-County area. Little Joey had a leg up because of the referral from Carrie's cousin, who had married a prominent East Hampton businessman. Just inside the door, a banner on the wall read, Preschool, the foundation for a lifetime of success. An aloof librarian-looking woman sat behind a desk in the foyer. May I help you? She said, peering down her nose over her horn-rimmed glasses at Little Joey. Mama, Joey groaned, just before projectile vomiting, a geyser of chocolate and french fries right onto the woman's desk. Oh, oh that's it. Yay. Yay. That's a great, that is a great ending. Oh. My favorite part was that she used Sprite to Me wet too. the baby wipes. What, you've never done that? Uh, <laughs> Can't say that I have, but I can totally relate. Otherwise, that's so hilarious. That was great. That was really good. You know so much about this whole group of people mm -hmm. in just those short number of words. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Okay, so now that uh, alienated cat lovers and children lovers. Okay. <laughs> 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 And but how many people workers. did you draw in with that, though, with your uh, description of baby care? Yeah, it was really good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of moms out there that can relate to that. Yeah. I would be one. All right. I'm going to go next so that I don't have to last. And I am the host, so I get to make that choice. <laughs> <laughs> the power. The power. It's kind of my head already. All right. So I did use all five words as well. I was very happy Yay. with myself. Um, Okay, here we go. It's because of all that chocolate you eat, Marnie said, handing me her foundation. Here, this should cover it up. I never have zits, but I hear that you can't see them through this stuff. I take the bottle and dab a bit of the tawny liquid makeup on the white head that has overtaken the middle of my chin. I think the only thing that will cover this up is a paper bag. She gives me the look. The one that says I'm annoying her. The aloof, I don't have time for this, stare that I've grown quite accustomed to. I'm not really certain why she even bothers. Just because we are cousins doesn't mean we have to hang out with each other or in or out of school. She has plenty of friends she could go to this silly football party with. I'd rather stay home and watch the new Netflix series starring Forrest Whitaker anyway. See how I fit Forrest in there? <laughs> Slick. There, see. That's much better, she says, grabbing the bottle for me and dabbing some of the more of the magic foundation and a few more less than perfect areas of my face. You really are pretty, you know. I don't know why you don't spend more time on your appearance. It wasn't the first time she had said it, and I didn't believe her any more this time than I did any of the other times. I'm not pretty. I'm not ugly, for sure, but I'm not pretty, especially when positioned next to Marnie. It's like putting a Picasso next to a Renoir. If by itself, you might look at a Picasso and think, hmm, that's an interesting work, but slide in a Renoir in next to it, and it looks like cob a cobbled mess of shapes and colors. That's me a cobbled piece of work. On my own, someone might look at my curly red hair and freckled face and think, hmm, she's interesting. But I guarantee when I walk into that party tonight next to Marnie with her flawless creamy complexion and silky auburn hair, I'll be looking Picasso all the way. I really wish you'd wear that green sweater I just bought. It will look much, so much better on you. It's the same shade as your eyes. She has moved on to my hair, dropping a few droplets of organic argon oil under her hands and running her fingers through my unruly waves. 
You know, she says nonchalantly, Drew Patson will be there. I try to act like it's no big deal, but she knows better. I've had a crush on Drew Patson since the third grade when he gave me a football for my birthday. Three, two, one. Yay. Yay. I really like that. And I like it uh, mm -hmm. first person. I never write first person, but lately I've been doing it. Like it's, I found myself writing first person in my nano project and I go back and fix it. And I'm like, what in the world? Yeah. I was going to so, comment on that. What's, what's making you do that? What's the inspiration? I did. I, you know, I read a lot and I, I did read a couple first person books a couple weeks ago, but like, I don't know why it's still in my head that way. So, and it, to me, it feels more young adult, which I've never written. So I don't know. it was mm -hmm. fun. Yeah, I, I, like more. That. I like I that whole story. I like how the setup, you've done a perfectly engaging, uh, like you told us a lot of information without it feeling like you're telling us a lot of information. It was really good. Thank you. I really, um, I really related to the whole argon oil and trying to yeah. do something, make your curves behave, curls. <laughs> <laughs> well, make your curls behave. If it would make curves behave, I'd be going out and buying a gallon jug of the stuff. But, yeah, I, I use it in my in my hair, my girl's hair too. So we don't have curly hair, but it does. It's good for your hair. So mm -hmm. awesome. Well, thank you, ladies. All right, Rhonda, we are waiting with bated breath for yours. Uh, okay. Um, the last two sentences are jump forward in time, so it's not going to make. I mean, just jump forward with me. We're um, there. We got gotcha. you. Yeah. I got all five words. Yay. 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 Six paragraphs. I can't believe it. <gasps> wow. Yay. Okay. Oh, and also, Jamie, is this, are we related? You just tell me when we're done. Okay. Okay. There's so many wedding dresses in here. How many wedding dresses are there? The peanut gallery in my head chants. There are so many dresses in here. My brain replies in its best comedian voice that it could be a satin forest. The peanut gallery booze. I wanted away from my bride to be cousin Amanda at some point. Now I regret that. I'm wandering among, among the racks and discovering that she could be unintentionally hiding anywhere. Oh, wait. My ears peer, perk and focus on a tinkling soprano voice a few hours away. As I push my way through the crinolines, being led by the sound of Amanda speaking, I giggle thinking of the first time I sat next to her in church, expecting to be awed as she sang the hymns, but instead trying not to cackle when she produced when well, what she produced could revival any barbershop quartet's bass sound. Oh, Amanda, that's lovely. I could hear her sister Sarah exclaim. Your petite figure makes all those gowns look perfect. She saw me come around the corner and looked me up and down, then back to Amanda. How could you ever choose only one? Amanda just clasped her face with her hands and looked in the mirror. Sarah looked back at me and tried to sound aloof. Foundation garments are this way. She threw her finger in a general direction. Would you like me to walk over there with you? I can sit with you a while. I can sit with you while you're fitted for a girdle. I think I'm keeping a straight face. Time to oh. work. You'll have a chocolate fountain, won't you, Annie Amanda? Asked her 10 year old niece Susie. She was here to be fitted for a junior bridesmaid's dress. Oh, those are so nasty, cried out Susie's sister Laura. Everyone dips their food into the same chocolate. Okay, the end. Yay. Yay. <laughs> I, I like love the it. use of the time warp to fit in the word chocolate. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Actually, I had that toward the top and I moved it to the bottom so I could add in some of the other things. Um, so, Jamie, really, did we share a cousin? Yeah, that's funny. I also, and also the whole wedding dress theme, too. Yeah. Like, where did that come from? Uh, that's interesting. Like, was there a word that made wedding seem? Yeah, when I thought chocolate, for some reason, I immediately thought chocolate fountain. And uh, I never see those unless it's at, like a bridal show or a wedding. Yeah, or for me, I knew foundation was ending up on a dress. So I had to have her have a reason to be putting on a dress. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. um, I so love I the way you think... use foundation too, Rhonda. Oh, that, that, that was yeah. really great. Yeah. Thank you. I really like that. Um, oh, I lost it. It went right out of Sorry. my Sorry. That's okay. Um, oh, the 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 joke that is dying. Oh. There are so many dresses in here. How many dresses are there? like people don't know to do that anymore? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I love that, and it's sad to me that that's not a part of our culture anymore. We need yeah. to figure out a way to make it, it hit with the kids. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, ladies. All right, awesome. Everybody feel like they're back as well fed. <clears throat> oh yes, yep. but are we going to talk about our openings? So oh, what were yeah. the openings? Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I opened with uh, 
Well, the cat was supposed to be a blessing, but it was a curse. So it was supposed to be like, hmm, why is the cat a curse? So I guess I was kind of trying to hook you mm -hmm. with the first sentence of um, why is this cat a curse, I guess. What about you guys? I opened up with, it's because of all the chocolate you eat and right in the middle of the fact that they're covering up a zit. So I've opened up in the problem. Yeah. And with a quotation. Yep. Like something mm -hmm. someone says. Yep. How about you guys? I opened with Carrie's thought that chocolate is a horrible substance. Mm -hmm. And the only thing worse than trying to wipe up a chocolate covered toddler. Mm -hmm. Try it out baby mm -hmm. wipes. So, 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 chocolate, so a shocking statement. Cause you know, chocolate is not terrible. And, <laughs> and uh, right. the baby, like the problem right in the middle of the problem. Yep. Mine was setting, I guess. Um, so many wedding dresses in here. I think everybody thought, I expected everybody to think it was a bridal shop. So. Yeah, at first I thought it was your closet, your closet oh. at first. And oh, then, oh. But as I got brought in, I'm like, oh, okay. Because I thought she'd maybe been a bridesmaid so many times. Or I, I love that. And I wasn't thinking wedding dresses. I was thinking dresses for a wedding. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. And you and you drew us right into the character's personality with the joke. Oh, so yes. I immediately liked her. Yeah, good. Me too. Good. I love her. I think she's is she your old standby character girl she that is. works for yeah. yeah, I love her. Love her. Well, thank you. All right. Everyone feel well fed? Mm -hmm. yes. yes, thanks. All right. So now it's time for us to move on to our accountability corner where we check in with each other and make sure that we are moving forward on our journey toward publication. Um, so Tina, you are on the very first person on the bottom of my screen. So we're going to start with you. Okay. Um, I'm actually ahead as far as my nano goal Yay. for nano camp. Um, I think it, I, I probably undershot when I made the goal. I probably should have made it bigger um, because I'm not really where I want to be in the editing. I, I wish I was further along, but I'm a, I made an hour goal, like 30 hours for the month, and I'm ahead that way. But I kind of feel like I wish I was further along in the actual editing. Um, but at the same time, I'm really happy with how the editing is going. So if I have to move a little slower to be that happy with how it's going, then I'm willing to do that. Good. If that so, makes sense. Yep. So moving forward, you're going to keep the same goal for next week? Like what, what should we expect from um, you? Um, my goal was still going to be show up to office hours every day, spend at least an hour of that in the editing. Um, and give, giving it the attend, I, I don't want to get caught up in, oh, I have to hurry up. <clears throat> I want, I want to be able to like kind of put on the brakes and make sure that quality over quantity, I guess is what I'm saying. Okay. So as long as I'm happy with the qual quality, I'm not going to beat myself up. All right. Jamie, how about you? Um, okay. Like I have a lot of thoughts, but I am doing great camp nano. I've got, um, 10 K plus words and then I'll write some more today. That is not an issue. I have made the conscious decision to stop editing my book because, okay, I have a physicality, um, to where when I'm feeling a lot of stress, I end up being short of breath. And when we were planning my wedding, I have this thing where it's like, until I almost yawn, I don't know, my glitching. Can you guys no, hear me? No, you're good. We're just listening. Okay. Cause you're all frozen on my screen. Uh -huh. Um, so, so that breathing problem had come back and I realized it was because I was putting all this pressure on myself that was really not necessary. There's hardly a line of people clamoring for me to hurry up and get book three out. So I just kind of put that away. And I'm doing Camp Nano and I'm reading. And um, so I'm writing every day and I'm just kind of like in a regroup phase so that I can figure out how to make this not feel like a heart attack. <laughs> and it's all just self-imposed. So I just have a mm -hmm. little bit of reevaluating to do. But I am going to continue doing the Nano piece. I'll get my 30000 this month. And then um, I'll have to come back at you with some more goals of what's next. Are you happy with those changes you made or are you, are you sure you're not shortchanging yourself? I mean, are you being I can't honest go and saying you short of breath? I can't yeah. go around um, physically manifesting 
the stress. Yeah, I understand no that. I understand so, that. Yeah, no, I'm I'm very happy that okay. I made this decision. All right. Well, that's the important thing then. Jamie, I really appreciate your transparency uh, with mm -hmm. us and with this podcast because I know that you are not alone in this. I know that like people watch yeah. us that um, are possibly not as far along in their journey as what we are, and they probably look at us and think, "I'm never going to get there." Like I can't even finish a project because I, I either I get anxiety ridden over it or because I'm too stressed out with everything else going on in my life. And and I think that it will be very good for people to see how honest you are and the fact that it happens to all of us. Like life becomes overwhelming and we have to know when to take care of ourselves and when to step back and say that this is not what I, this is not where I'm supposed to be and I just really appreciate that your, your willingness to do that and be that person so. well great then I'm glad I shared I'm glad you did too all right Rhonda how about you okay <clears throat> so when I set my goal I have not made my goal I told you that earlier uh, when I set my goal originally, to be honest, it was really kind of just arbitrary. It was just, I knew that I was leaving for Florida on um, April 12th. And so I wanted to be done with the book before then. And honestly, I didn't understand everything that goes into actually, not only just the writing part, but the um, making sure the photographs are what I want and, um, you know, the formatting and everything else. I was only looking at, do I have all the information? and is it compiled? And um, so that was the wrong way. But they always say the first book is the hardest. And I've learned a lot of lessons. I've got a ton of notes of ways to that things that aren't necessary for next time and things that I do want to add or work on a little bit harder next time. Um, but I'll tell you, when I am done with this book, I'm going to be so happy with it. And <clears throat> I had a discussion with the uh, curators at one of the museums yesterday, and um, I was feeling a lot better about that. And uh, so anyway, all that to say, did not meet my goal, but I am still chugging along and really happy with the progress now that I'm being more realistic with um, what has to happen. Yeah, it's kind of hard to look forward um, when you're doing something you've never done before right. and try yes. to predict how long it's going to take you and when you should be finished. And mm -hmm. to make a goal like that is difficult because there's a thousand problems that could pop up that you had no clue were even going to happen. Exactly. And so we set a goal just to kind of give us the motivation to go forward, but mm -hmm. we have to be flexible to change it when what we thought was the truth turns out not to be, and we have to adjust. Right. Yeah. Because if I hadn't set that date, then I wouldn't have been working so hard to get it done just out of pride's sake, you know? So. Yeah. The day was important. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you, Rhonda. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would just double up on what Tina said. When I first did my first book, it's a lot more than what you think. And there's so much more that you have to go back and fix. And you think you have it fixed and there's something else to go fix. And it's just, it's a process. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, you'll get there. And like the first book is always the worst. I hope so. Because I hope the second <laughs> yeah. book was a lot smoother for me than the first book did. Mm -hmm. So. All right. So for me, I am behind on my Camp Nano project. Like I had mentioned a little bit earlier in my, um, my what's up time. Um, I just can't get these contemporary novels out of my head. I'm just so like everywhere I turn, I see something that I'm like, Oh, I can put that in the novel or, Oh, that would be a great thing to add. Or, and, and, um, so my, it's like my headspace is just completely overwhelmed with these contemporary novels that I want to do someday but I'm not ready to do them. So I don't want to switch my project. So I guess um, for moving forward, my goals for next week are I need to be caught up on my Camp Nano project, the numbers by next uh, podcast. Um, and I, unless something major changes, it, I will be still sticking with my Widow of the West, Widows of the West book one. <laughs> So um, I guess that's where I'm at right now. Is that's the one thing I'm focusing on is get my numbers back up there, and I can do it. It's, I'm not that far behind. So, so Jen, you did say you're not interested in switching your project, but I think it's important to point out to people who are listening that if you sign up for Camp Nano and you want to change your goal, that's totally allowed, right? Like it's supposed to be a relaxed kind mm -hmm. of a thing. Yeah, it's much more relaxed than than regular Nano Um Plus, let's be honest. Like you're not going to like get shot if in regular NaNoWriMo you change your project or you do something different. You know, this is, it really is a self-motivational tool. 
Um, but yeah, I just don't, I'm, I have such high expectations for these other books that, and I'm not ready to start writing them. I don't want to just start cobbling together. I'm using that word again, cobbling together uh, just because I'm trying to reach some numbers. I, um, I have more prep done for the widows of the West than I do for the contemporary novels. So I'm just going to stick it out and really keep reminding myself that great novels are not written. They're edited. So just write it, get it written and I can make it great later. So I, I would like, in. Oh, sorry. I would just like to know, um, are people just forgetting to update in the cabin or are we really as behind as a cabin as it looks like we are? <laughs> yeah, we about it completely. Yeah. I keep forgetting to go in there. No, I'm just behind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you're at about 4,000 words. Yep. Yep. Okay. I, I mean, yeah, I can still do it. I can, I mean, this is, it's, my goal is only a thousand words a day. So um, I'm not that far. I mean, I am far behind, but it's not undoable for me. So we'll right. see. Um, I was going to say, I, I kind of had the same kind of issue. Um, what, is, what was it? A couple of months ago where I had this idea for a civil war novel and it was just like, like totally um, taking over my brain power. <laughs> like my brain just wanted to go there. And so I had like four or five scenes that were just burned into my head and I sat down and wrote a first draft of all of them. And then it kind of eased up and I was able to go back to, I mean, sometimes you just got to get it out on paper or something or a screen. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because I did do that. One of my days this last week, I spent all of my sprints writing my what if statements and, and then this can happen and then this can happen for, for those contemporaries to get it out of my system so I didn't lose them. So I think it's a really good point. leave you alone after that sometimes. Sometimes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. I'm still trying to move forward. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that about does it for this podcast, this episode. Um, normally, we would say join us. Uh, right after this with the postcast, but today we are not doing a postcast because one of our members dropped the ball. And um, the rest of the members have so graciously decided not to go on without me. So we are going to take a break this week, which I think we probably could use um, a break. And there will be no po postcast for this episode, um, but join us next week where we for sure will have another podcast and we will for sure have a postcast next week. Um, also, don't forget to go ahead and sign up for our emails. We will always send you a reminder that we have um, broadcasted and you'll be able to catch up with us. And if we have any um, free giveaways, we, which we do, when you sign up, make sure you head on over to our website at christianindiewriters.net and sign up for our emails there. And there's Thank some you, freebies ladies. you get that go with that, too. We have a couple freebies still in there, right? Yep, that's what I said. Yep. yep. For, okay. Yep, to give I wasn't listening. <laughs> <laughs> this concludes the christian indie writers podcast we thank you so much for joining us and until next week may your pen be prolific may your deadlines be met and may all of your words honor christ bye now bye, bye. bye.